Um, this is Fishing with VoIP. Um, we're taking a look at some new attack techniques and a review of some uh, preventive policies to protect um, your company's assets if you guys have companies, um, as well as an overview of detection and evidence gathering for prosecution or lack thereof. The points of interest that I'm going to cover in this talk is uh, the proof of concepts, the actual systems. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples as well. Um, fear. Also, I'm going to show the anonymity of the attacks, how people can stay anonymous, and how it is very hard to track these people. Um, we're going to talk about some of the losses um, by the consumers and corporations that are affected by these, and some suggestions for defensive thinking. The enterprise attack. This type of attack can go down in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to show some couple examples. The enterprise attack, if a malicious, uh, like Freaker would, not Freaker, malicious Fisher would get their hands on like an email list, um, they can just send out mass emails to a particular corporations, like customers, stating some type of ruse where they need to call in to, you know, something's wrong with their account, they need to call in, blah, blah, blah. And they'll put a number in the email. When the customer calls that number back, they get a system that sounds exactly like um, an IVR system for the company that they're pretending to be, like Washington Mutual, T-Mobile, et cetera. Um, I do have, show an example. What you're about to hear, it's actually I'm not sure how it's going to sound, so give me a second to adjust it. I've never seen this phone in my life. <laughs> right now, I'm listening to uh, one of his ringtones by mistake. This is a fear. Dude, in call you. There we go. You see how the call came in here? You can see ahead at any time. For information on your personal account, including your ATM or debit card, press 1. For online banking, press 2. For small business, press 3. For questions, we call you. One moment, please. And this is all going on my system. All this audio that you're hearing is coming from my system, and all of this data is being logged. So, you know, they put it in, it logs it, but it says that it didn't. Because it's trying to get more information. I don't know if 
if you can see that. You cannot process that number. Please enter your 16-digit credit card account number. Now it goes for the full, like, 16-digit number. This just actually happens when you call their system if you enter, like, the wrong information. I'm just going to put in some silly stuff. What I just entered, what I just entered, it saved it in there. We did not receive your entry. If you cannot locate your credit card number, or if you're calling to check on the status of your application, enter your nine-digit social security number, followed by the pound sign. So I put it in. It did. Now it's going to ask it twice just in case they entered the wrong number. Or if you're calling to check on the status of your application, enter your nine digit social security number. Oh, oh. Please call for assistance to ensure quality service. The call may be monitored or recorded. Now it's going to throw them on hold. Yeah. Now, what I could do is, I'm done. No. I apologize because I've never seen this phone in my life. I, mean, I don't know. I'm a new. But uh, I don't know how well you guys can see it over here. But all that information I just put in, it just logged it all in like a uh, like a MySQL database. Um, now, what I, if I wanted to, I could set up like a queue, which I was going to do because I brought some several phones around here. I was going to try to register, but I was being blocked to be able to have my devices actually register out and come in. So I wouldn't be able to show that, so I apologize. But you can have it ring any, any SIP phone, any cell phone, anything you want to use. You know, you can have it ring those phones at the same time. And, you know, you just pick up the phone, thanks for calling, whatever. That's what these people are doing. They're doing stuff like this. Um, another type of attack that I'd like to talk about would be the the man in the middle attack. Now, people who, who research about phishing, they're aware of the man in the middle attack. This particular man in the middle attack has to do with, with your phone call being routed, not with your computer. So, it's not just people getting a hold of email lists and stuff. A lot of these attacks are, are being taken place on the services side. Um, I'm not sure if, if how many people are aware, but if you have a toll-free number in your business, the only thing that's required for you to reroute your toll-free number to another DNS or POTS is just to have the business name and the shipping or in, in the billing address for the company that you have. Um, so that's very bad because how easy is it to get the business name of a phone number and how easy is it to get the business billing address? Very, very easy. So if a person has this information, they can reroute certain percentages of the calls coming in to the the company's voice systems. So what the malicious Fisher would do is they would call up and, and either uh, social engineer to have like you know 15 percent going to their POTS line which wouldn't be a very difficult thing to do at all. So 15 percent of the time for all calls coming in it would come in and hit the Fisher's VoIP platform which then in turn not playing any audio all of the media is coming from the actual corporation's IVR system. The, the agents that you, that you would hear on the phone would be the actual real agents that work for the company. When the call comes in, when a customer tries to place a call and they call the real telephone number for the corporation, it would hit the Fisher's system, okay? As soon as it hits that system, the Fisher could tell the call, complete control of the call. What they would do is, um, send out another call spoofing charge number. I'm not sure if people are aware of that, but spoofing charge number is just like spoofing caller ID. It's just with SS7, it's more, it's one of the fields. Um, back out to the corporation's number. So when an agent would reach, would get the call, the real representative for the company would get the call. They would be talking to the real customer. Both parties would be met. However, the agent for the corporation would also see that the person is calling from their telephone number. So I don't know how they were going to tell um, that it's any different. And I, was, I, I have an example of that as well. I apologize about the phone. 
An uh, example of that would be this. Now take in mind, the audio that you're hearing from this is coming from the actual Washington Mutual system, not to say Washington Mutual. I think this is the number. Just forgot the number. Okay, it just came in. Thank you. Thank you for calling Washington Mutual. Better than information in Espanol, Marque Ocho, and you know your select. If you have your account number, I am now connecting you with a telephone banker. I just skipped it just to get through to the rest. Our bankers are currently assisting other customers. Please stay on the line and we will be with you shortly. To help serve you better, please have your account number ready. I went through a different option, by the way, as well, so... This actual, like, system is completely mocked to the T, like, Spanish, everything, so... Can you, can you guys see this okay? Like, what's going on on the screen? Right, if you look over here... Um... I, I fear. Okay, um, what happens is it, it answered the call and automatically threw like the, the calling party number into a MySQL database, labeled it called fish, and then set out, um, you know, set call ID as the number that I called from and then placed an outbound call to the toll-free number um, for, you know, a lot of companies have multiple toll-free numbers that go to like the same systems, like MCI is an example, 800-444-4444, 800-444-3333, you know, etc. So all this is doing is just wrapping around the numbers and everything that is going on between the customer and the agent is being recorded um, in the three different audio files in the middle from the um, system that it hit. So they're reaching real agents, they're reaching that's just a man in the middle attack. The next one is the individual target attack. Um, the individual target attack is kind of the, it's, uh, it's when you, you know, target an individual. An example of that would be, this is like a level seven. Um, say there's Wendy, okay? Wendy's the target. Now, what the malicious person would do is they would have, you know when you send an email to like uh, T-Mobile's uh, cell phones like um, number at, my, at t mobilenet it shows up, if it's just an email with text, it shows up from like 603 and then, you know, your email credentials. Now, when you receive a text message from T-Mobile themselves, it comes up the similar way with the same from 603 or 602, whatever the same like three digit number. Well, someone can easily spoof an email, you know, from that. When they receive it on their phone, they can put, in, put a message on their phone like, you know, please call T-Mobile risk assessment immediately before your account gets, you know, suspended. Um, then they would call another one of these systems. It's exactly the same way set up, same prompts and stuff. But what happens is at the other end is um, the, uh, uh, the fisher. And they can use like a social engineer attack once they get the call, like, um, you know, thanks for calling T-Mobile, this is Chet, 729-420, um, can I have your mobile number please? The person would say, you know, they give them the mobile number, 
after they get them all the number, and they'd be like, all right, what's the what's, what's your passcode? And they'd tell them what the passcode is, and then they would say, all right, well, before I can go any further, I have to um, verify your account to the fullest extent. Your account has been flagged. And they'd be like, okay, and they'd be like, what's your, you know, nine digit social security number? What's your billing address on the account? Um, take in mind, these people were calling back a number, a toll free number, that's the same exact prompts. You can't really tell, you know? It's the same prompts. So when they get a customer representative on the other side asking these questions, trying to verify their account, I mean, you know, every time I call, not all the time, but people verify. But it, it's, it's not a hassle, but, you know, people verify. It's a, normal, it's a normal process of doing business when you call in to make changes in your account. Now, after he gives them that information, what's he going to do? Just hang up? No, he wants to play it off smooth like so that he doesn't even know anything has even happened. So he would say to them, all right, your account's been locked. Um, it, it's been flagged. This is what he's saying to Wendy. He says, uh, someone tried to access your account more than 10 times without providing the, the, the password, and we didn't think it was you. We have an automatic script on our system that if that happens, your account gets locked. Once your account gets locked, we try to get a hold of you through the risk assessment team and um, create like a more difficult password if you feel that your password could be breached. So what would you like your, your password to be? And, and Wendy would make up a new password. After making up a new password, finish the call, call up you know, T-Mobile, add a new password to the account because you already have the first password because they just gave it all, you, all of the information, you know? The anonymity of the malicious attackers, the way that they keep hidden, there's access to free open source, you know, VoIP platforms. Um, there's free PBXs all over the place. I'm not going to mention any of them. Um, my favorite is Astro Fierce. Free switch. <laughs> um, access to free incoming um, direct and word dialed numbers, um, DIDs. You know, you only need an email address to set them up. They can be rerouted to like a new IP address real time. So you don't need to have your, your SIP server be in one location at all times. You can always update that information when you're having a number with no information, you know. The use of an open Wi-Fi connection with a bootable SIP server from a CD. A person could go sit on someone's uh, Wi-Fi, you know, an open access point, spoof their MAC address if they want, you know, and just load their SIP server from their CD and just put their uh, configs on it. And now they're completely on someone else's network, running their own PBX system, receiving all the calls, changing location whenever they want. Spoofing charge number that's related to the man in the middle attack, and also when so, um, social engineering um, service providers. Um, if you know about spoofing charge number, Google it. You'll, you'll see. Spoofing MAC address, like I mentioned, just another way of you know keeping yourself hidden. It affects the consumer by identity theft, um, diminished credit score. Anxiety about personal information. I know I flip out all the time. I don't know what's going on with my info. Um, and it leads to problems in personal life, you know, like arguments with your wife, um, with your husband, you know, like, why can't we get this house? Why can't we get this car? You know, you, you have credit problems, you have credit problems. And if it's not your fault, it becomes really frustrating. Um, very, very, very time consuming. I don't know who has had um, identity theft in this room in the past, but you know that it takes so long to fix. How it affects the corporations, you know, more chargebacks, unnecessary charges, charges that are fraudulent, you know, higher premiums for their insurance, um, trust issues with customers, like customers are not going to really know who to do business with, they're not going to know who they're talking to when, they're, when they pick up the phone, they're going to hear the same prompts, but who's really at the other end? Bad publicity, you know. Um, revenue loss. That's what it ends up being. Um, some suggestions. On the services side, like AT&T, uh, MCI, LCI, International, which is Quest, um, Sprint, you know, they handle these toll-free services for these businesses. Those are the points that, that are going to be attacked as well. Um, I recommend having like a group email alert from the services side. So when someone calls in the AT&T and they make a change on your on your network for what DNS is being sent over or 
if there's any changes to the routing of your telephone numbers that's going into your company, that there needs to be a group notification um, sent out. And the reason why I say group is you could have someone that has that position and they get fired or they leave, they quit, and then where does it get picked up at, you know? Um, raise awareness to customers to reach your customer service only from the numbers indicated at website. Now, if they make sure that they have some type of group email alert when something's changed and they make sure that the customers only call the numbers that are on the website, that's not going to be completely 100% foolproof because you know that that's not ever going to happen, but that's going to be pretty good, you know. Make it known that your company is ready to prosecute to the fullest extent and is aware of such attacks. You're not just like an idiot, you know, like not a noob. Um, consider some new ways of authenticating customers to representatives and vice versa. There's never really been ever a company that has allowed you to verify who they are. It's always been about who you are. Now, with these types of attacks happening, the consumer really wants to know, who are you? Are you really the company that I do business with, you know? Um, there's never really been anything like that. Maybe there could be some type of passcode or something that the, that the representative could read off of their, that their account so they can be like, all right, your passcode's this. Or you know, some, some type of authentication. I'm just throwing that off the top of my head. Evidence gathering. If such attacks have been made, you want to make sure that you find the time when changes have been made. If someone has rerouted your number, you want to know exactly when these changes have been made. You want to check the SS7 records for when the call came in um, that made the routing changes. When you check the SS7 records, you want to make sure and check the JIP parameter, the JIP, the Jurisdiction Information Parameter. Uh, it's in the SS7 records. It indicates what switch that the call came, came from. Now, when people spoofing the uh, charge number, calling party number, call ID, all that stuff, it's still going to show up. They're not going to know what's going on, but if they look at the JIP parameter, they're going to see what switch, MPA, NXX, that the call came from. So then they can narrow it down and talk to that particular provider. And um, when they subpoenaed that telecommunications provider that's going from that switch, then um, they can grab all the IP information from who registered, they can grab the MAC address, um, I put it, you know, sure the attack could have probably came from like a Wi-Fi connection, but, you know, you always got to, you always got to check all ends. Um, one thing that when you are investigating, you want to make sure that um, you check all the, all the activity on the account. Like the first number dialed, uh, as an example, I don't know. Who's ever set up like a um, voicemail in here for K7? Has anyone ever heard of like K7.net? What's the first phone that you ever call from that number, like that you ever call to your voicemail? Your phone, right? You call from your phone to activate it. Most people do that and they don't think about it. Um, that's, that's it's, you know, you can track people down to like call logs and whatnot. Um, but once you get the, the MAC address, you want to check it, make sure because it probably was spoofed, but if not, whatever. People make mistakes, you know. You, know, you can subpoena the, comp the, the, uh, the, the computer manufacturer, hosting provider for the billing information of the MAC address if, if it is valid, but just options. Um, if you're a fall victim to these attacks, um, tracking the malicious fishers can uh, be an exhausting task. Um, you just don't ever want to give up. Everyone makes mistakes. Stay on top of the investigation and always remember uh, to make the malicious criminals fear. So, um, that's it. Yeah. Um, there's been some rumor of BGP router hijacks to um, voice response systems. Um, do you have any, you know, information regarding that, um, those? What was that? Um, people hide doing um, BGP hijacks of VoIP uh, system IP addresses to route them to a false um, IVR. Uh, my experience, the easiest way to reroute um, traffic from one IVR to another IVR would be hitting the services side, like AT&T, MCI. 
you call in the middle of the night. If you, have, if you own a company and you have a toll-free number going, all you need is your billing address and your name of your company to, change, to make changes. Um, real time. If you want to change your, num your toll-free number, instead of going to a DNS to something, you can have it go to like a POTS line, which would be your DID registered with the uh, SIP server that you have, which if you're on an open Wi-Fi network, you can reroute that traffic to whatever IP on your own side um, through your DIDs after your, the toll-free number has already been rerouted to the DID. Um, what are you talking about? I don't know. That's just the easiest way I, I would think to get to get that solution done. Uh, uh, now, when uh, you, the man-in-the-middle attack is being done, uh, say using asterisk, how is the when uh, does does it pass the audio of the DTMF tones along to the uh, to the real uh, voice response system or with the with the particular SIP server that I use, it doesn't. Um, so it plays the sound so the user hears the you No, know, because the way that it's set up it, it it doesn't need DTMF. When it knows that it needs to use DTMF, it generates it itself. Um, I mean will you hear it if you push a button? You're not gonna hear it, it's gonna be muted. You know how when you hear recorded it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be the way that the server that I'm going through right now, it's muted. But all audio is recorded into three files. So, um, I mean, in channel, out channel and mixed. I mean if you're doing a man in the middle attack. How does it pass the DCMF tones that the user is pushing to the to the real voice response unit? How does it relay it? It, it doesn't. It depends. It it, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. Um, it, it only passes. It only only records audio. That, that that particular method on the server that I'm using. No, 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 no I mean, I mean, in your end. On my I, end. I mean, yeah. You I know, Asterisk just doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't pass on DTMF tones. Normally. Yeah, it doesn't pass on DTMF to record. So, so how does it? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, 